you yeah, I just, yeah, I just give the permission to Professor Min and Kun. Thank you. And also these uh, technical supporters, could you um, record it in your site too? Okay, I record. I start Thank recording. Thanks. Okay, so may I start? I think it's time to start this session. Okay, so hello everyone. Uh, we start the opening for API conference. Uh, I am Atsuki Morishima from the University of Tsukuba. And uh, uh, did, would you uh, turn on your camera? Okay. Yes, and she is a D, Dr. D1 from uh, Wuhan University in China. So we are co-organizing API conference this year in cooperation with ICAS committees. Actually, we had a joint keynote uh, in the past day, but uh, we assume that uh, for some people, today is the first day to attend this event. So let me briefly introduce the conference. Uh, the first API conference was held in Seoul in 2014. And the first time we had a joint event with ICAD was in the 2016. And uh, we has been, have been holding doctoral consortium uh, with ICADR and ALEAP. Uh, we think it's uh, very important to provide a place uh, in which researchers in the information field in Asia Pacific region get together. And we really appreciate the cooperation uh, of the ICADR and the ALEAP community. And uh, this is, uh, shows uh, today's highlight. We have a very interesting keynote uh, by Professor Kam. And then the, we have a panel for our young researchers uh, by the Dr. D1. And uh, in the afternoon, we have the graduate student sessions. And uh, after the sessions, uh, we will have the closing session of the ICADR and APIC I conference. And uh, we really uh, appreciate the contribution uh, by the program committees and advisors. Okay, so that's uh, the end of the opening of the API, API conference. And I'd like to hand it over to Professor uh, Sugiyama for the keynote session. I will stop sharing my screen. Okay, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, good morning. Good afternoon and good evening to everyone all over the world. Welcome to Keynote 2 session. I'm Kazunari Sugiyama from Kyoto University. Today, we have an excellent speaker, Professor Mien Kang from National University of Singapore. Uh, let me introduce him. Uh, Mien Kang is an associate professor at the National University of Singapore. He is a senior member of the ACM and a member of the IEEE. Currently, he is an associate editor for Springer Information Retrieval Journal and is the editor for the ACL Anthology, which is the computational linguistics community's largest archive of published research. His contribution is recognized as the Association for Computational Linguistics 
Distinguished Service Award. His research interests include digital library and applied natural language processing. A specific projects include work in the areas of scientific discourse analysis, through text literature mining, machine translation, and applied text summarization. He is also a winner of Best Paper Award at JCDL 2013 and CIKM 2020. I have known him for more than 10 years. He is a full of wit and humor. So I hope you enjoy his talk. Min, you can start your talk if you are ready. Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks, Dr. Sugiyami. Uh, or Kaz, as I know him very well. Uh, he's actually um, being a bit modest himself because he was a co-author on both of the best paper awards. Uh, the one at JCDL is uh, actually his primary work and the one um, in 2020 was uh, joint advising work uh, uh, with a student at NUS. So I'm really pleased uh, today to give you a talk uh, about research fast and slow. And if you'd like to get the slides, um, there's the PDF link up there at the top uh, left cor uh, right corner and a QR code if you have a camera phone with you. Okay, so uh, many of you may have heard about uh, the book, uh, Thinking Fast and Slow. It's uh, written by this gentleman on the left. Um, this is Daniel Kahneman and uh, Amos Tversky, his co-author, uh, wrote uh, this book that popularized the idea of a um, uh, lot of psychological research in uh, system one and system two. So uh, system one is the idea that we actually have two different systems at work um, when we are thinking. Um, so system one is the, the fast automatic uh, system that's sort of uh, based in our reptilian core. Uh, uh, so it's intuitive, um, it has fast reactions, it's uh, something that we really have no uh, innate control over, um, and it's a very associative type of memory style. But humans have evolved, of course, from that uh, uh, very uh, uh, primeval uh, way of thinking. And we also have a system too, as it's popularized. Um, it goes by many different names, but he chose a, a simple numbering system to, to go away from the semantics uh, that's associated with uh, different names. And system two is a much more controlled methodological, methodological um, uh, logically reasoned system. It's something that we can only focus on one thing at a time. Um, and uh, it has a, a very uh, meticulous nature, okay? Um, and uh, there are other two things that he popularized uh, from his research. One of them is the anchoring heuristic, uh, the idea that when you start a negotiation, uh, the first person uh, who anchors the conversation uh, helps to uh, form all of the associations around that. So for example, in buying or selling an asset, having the first price being ridiculously high or ridiculously low anchors the process and things are all relative to that uh, first um, number that might be given. Also about the availability heuristic. So this is the idea that uh, you know, when you step on an airplane because of the associations that you might have about airplane uh, in the news crashing or um, uh, disasters, we might have an uh, overly sensitive idea about um, uh, uh, airplane disasters that's not actually founded uh, given the statistical and probabilistic uh, uh, reasons or, or uh, occurrences that it actually does happen. So now we're at the point where when we think about uh, advances in digital libraries, it goes hand in hand with uh, machine intelligence, uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning. And uh, one person who's very core to that conversation has been Andrew Ng. So he uh, created the first uh, 
large, uh, massive online open courses uh, in Coursera, uh, along with Daphne Kohler. And uh, he, again, said in one of his talks that uh, we've gotten really good at doing certain things with uh, what's now popularly called deep learning, right? And that deep learning is actually really catered to a certain type of judgment. So I'd like to argue that it's more like system one, all right? When we do pattern recognition or use face recognition of technology or now, you know, using natural language technology to generate or uh, form uh, judgments about language, it's really more the system one type. So we have uh, large neural networks that can take in lots of uh, different types of inputs, uh, make very detailed judgments of them. But uh, for the most part, those things are opaque. Uh, they can be run in parallel. Um, they are very automatic um, and, and they're not very scrutinizable in terms of the transparency of their judgment. So I'd like you to think about for a second, because this talk is about research fast and slow, okay? Um, when we think about digital libraries and we think about the direction of research that our uh, human sciences are heading in, what do we think about the loss function of research? So for those of you who are familiar with uh, re uh, machine learning, this is probably an easy idea. Uh, but what I mean by loss function is how do we optimize what we are studying, okay? How do we decide which problems are worthwhile to study and uh, come up with research agendas that we might write in research proposals that uh, our students or our uh, beginning scholars might be looking for uh, dissertation topics. And while we're on this subject, I also want to mention another author. This is uh, Thomas Friedman. Um, he's an author who's written uh, quite a lot of uh, different books. One is The Age of Accelerations. Um, uh, and another one that I've read, uh, which I think is very pertinent to this, is Thank You for Being Late. So if you have some time on your hands over the, the winter holidays, if you haven't read this book, I, I would encourage you to take a look at it uh, for lateral side thinking. So he mentions uh, this problem of the age of acceleration where there's a tale about uh, a chessboard. So um, uh, pardon me while I digress for uh, a couple minutes here. So there was a, uh, a peasant uh, who helped out a king uh, very long ago. And uh, as a reward, the king said, well, you've helped out the kingdom so much, uh, how can I reward you? And the peasant thought about it a minute and said, well, I'm a simple man. Uh, all I want is some rice to feed my family. Uh, and the king said, well, you're being too modest. Uh, name anything you want, gold, uh, you know, uh, uh, riches, land, uh, whatever I can offer you, uh, we are in your debt. He said, no, I think rice would be fine. Um, could you do me a favor and uh, get a chessboard? And on the chessboard, maybe you can put one grain of rice in the first uh, cell of the chessboard. Uh, and uh, two grains of rice in the second uh, area of the chessboard, and then double it as we go along until we finish the whole chessboard. And the king thought about it and says, yes, that's very reasonable. There's no problem. We will uh, definitely accede to this demand. And of course, you and I know this uh, turns out to be an exponential rate of uh, increase. And so the, the king was bankrupt and uh, you know, the empire fell apart as a part of this request uh, by this peasant who had saved the kingdom. Um, so what this is illustrating is that really the exponential increase uh, really matters a lot. So it may not be evident in the first half of the chessboard, meaning that the first 32 squares, that there's a lot that's going to happen towards the end, right? So the idea is that because of this exponential rate of growth, uh, things really get blown out of proportion towards the second half. And Ray Kurzweil alluded to this problem that there would be a lot of um, changes happening uh, because of this acceleration. And there were a couple things that he wanted to illustrate as um, a part of this, which was that there are several key features of the world as a whole that is making acceleration um, a constant problem or a constant phenomenon. One, of course, in uh, computing is Moore's law, right? The doubling of both storage and um, computational power that keeps on uh, reoccurring. Second is globalization, the idea that um, 
a lot of different products, uh, a lot of different services are dependent on uh, interconnections between nations, which has an implication for a geopolitical uh, politics uh, and, and uh, other problems, but also that Mother Nature herself is uh, getting a uh, bearing the brunt of all, a lot of this acceleration. So we see climate change uh, is just taking off at this point, uh, but uh, will will definitely accelerate and cause a lot of changes in the way that uh, our human civilization has to deal with things. Okay, so uh, why are these important? Okay, um, it is because of a lot of things. Because these three accelerations also change the way we do research. So um, when I was a youngster, I played a lot of video games, like uh, probably many of you. Um, and there was this one game by Microprose uh, that uh, was simulating uh, simula uh, alien civilizations. And uh, one of the things that you could do was uh, get technological advances. And one of them was this galactic cybernet uh, which allowed you to, um, as it says here, have nearly instantaneous galaxy-wide communications, enhancing the research capabilities of scientists and spying powers of agents, which would double your research capacity. Okay, and so when we think about this, really, we actually have this invention already. Um, many of us turn to archive uh, in natural language processing in digital libraries, especially in machine learning research, to read preprints of publications that are happening. So actually, the idea of research getting faster is all accelerating because of those three trends that I mentioned earlier, and because we have invested a lot in uh, making research even more replicatable. And uh, you'll see this uh, often even in the way that things are uh, communicated in the timeline of attention. Right. Typically in library science, we rely on journal publications. Uh, this is still very typical today, but especially in computer science, especially in uh, you know applied machine learning areas, we see this uh, uh, time lag between uh, publication or even pre-publication and uh, use uh, being cut down in terms of half lives. Right. So you can see here, um, even before publications are. Uh, uh, published, actually, we sometimes see tweets about that research come out, um, you know, then they're posted on archive, then uh, these days, uh, especially in machine learning research gets picked up very uh, soon after that uh, publication on archive, and people start to blog about it, share about it, uh, even Wikipedia articles are faster than our, our citations in journals and even in conferences. And um, finally, um, probably months later, we see the first citations of research come out. So um, that is a vicious cycle, right? Or a virtuous cycle, depending on how you think of it. Research is getting faster and faster. You know, our, our ways of communicating are faster uh, and that begets research uh, happening faster. But could it be the case that research is going actually a bit too fast? So in the background in this picture, we have a scientist and uh, an assistant, okay? I'd like you to think about which one is the assistant and which one is the scientist. Actually, the scientist is right here, okay? This is an automated wet lab, meaning it is able to do the experiments uh, and do the research itself autonomously. And the assistant who's on the, the right the person who's helping the automated scientists refill reagents. Okay, so he's not actually doing any of the deductions. Uh, the, the laboratory equipment is doing all of the research. Okay, so actually I'd like to argue we have our own age of accelerations for research, um, right? Uh, we already have, as I mentioned, archive, uh, which is uh, making preprints and disseminating them uh, at, very much almost instantaneous speed in uh, Chinese, especially in the dialect here in Singapore. We have a term for something uh, uh, called kiasu. Um, it's written as these uh, kanji characters, as you can see here. And this means fear of losing out. 
So uh, we see this a lot in our researchers, especially our young researchers today, that uh, always worry about being uh, scooped uh, by other research groups uh, early. And so they uh, feel a need to put preprints up as soon as they have an idea, even before things are proven. And um, uh, I'd argue that that's not always a productive way of uh, doing science. Um, we also have things that help to do reproducibility, and that's a good thing, but it also aids research fast. And one of those uh, things are GitHub and Jupyter Notebooks. So now uh, there's a lot of um, uh, experimental research, especially in computer science, can be automated uh, using notebooks that allow you just to click to run the experiments again and to reproduce uh, experimental results. We have GitHub to disseminate code, so you can fork a repository and just run uh, the experiments uh, again. And we also have shared tasks. This is a very common practice that we see in um, uh, natural language processing and computer vision, where you have data sets that are supposedly difficult, um, and many people uh, start to work on tasks uh, on those data sets and uh, there's research improvement. And I, I know a number of us have been involved in uh, the IR community, which really spearheaded that. Uh, for example, Doug Ord uh, and, and Adam, um, both of them have uh, participated in a number of shared tasks over the years. And um, in one way, it's a good thing uh, because you can find an easy topic for a student to work on. And uh, on, in another way, it helps to um, help milestone what we are doing. Uh, you know, it's concrete. Uh, there are numbers involved. We can have statistical significance tests, and um, that helps bridge the spectrum um, going uh, towards a more definite goal of improving performance. So um, we can think that uh, working on shared tasks helps us uh, uh, have a more definite feel about research, but in some ways, maybe we're just making things even faster, okay? And my argument here is that all of these research fast protocols that we have engineered for ourselves in our communities, especially um, towards the applied machine learning areas, uh, they actually shape us a lot. Um, they change the uh, ideas of research uh, to an extent that sometimes uh, we are doing research, begetting research without really thinking about the underlying issues that we need to solve. So I'd like to stop for a second and um, think about another thing. Okay, so uh, here we have a neat summary of the current state of interpretations of skull comparisons in biological anthropology. So um, I'm asking you to spot the difference here. So we have male skulls, female skulls, white skulls, black skulls, Skulls from rich people, skulls from poor people, skulls from gay people, skulls from straight people, okay? And we have skulls from reviewer too, right? So um, what I'm trying to say with this is that uh, many times, even in the way we think about peer reviewed results, we have a way of uh, favoring defensible positions. So remember what I just said about um, uh, shared tasks, uh, GitHub, all of these things are helping to propagate research in a certain direction. And when we have these types of things, reviewers also want to be able to defend their positions when they're reviewing peer reviewed work, right? So they'll want to see, for example, statistical significance, they want to see reproducible code, and all of these check marks are now things that uh, especially junior reviewers will rely on as quality markers. Not to say that they aren't, uh, but they are uh, a way of making a checklist, so to speak, of what to look for in, in research without really thinking about whether the science that's being uh, promulgated by a, a submission is really the right thing to do. So it becomes a case where we have these uh, reproducibility um, and other types of statistical testing that we have um, decided that are important, and then people are starting to rely on those uh, for measures of, of success. Okay, so I'm, I asked you earlier to think about this idea of the loss function of research. You know, when we 
do research as humanity, what are we trying to look at, right? So um, in machine learning, what we typically do is we say, okay, uh, we're going to choose a particular model. We're going to um, start a search for the right parameters of that model. So with different parameters, um, a particular machine model may do better or worse, for example, at detecting the sentiment of a sentence, okay? And so we might start uh, our search at a particular location, let's say uh, taking a parameter setting that would end up around here. And what we can do is then use the idea of a loss function to decide which area in this space to search, right? So we could search around that area. Okay, let's see whether I can find my cursor, it's disappeared. So around this area, maybe I want to find the, the right settings that will improve my performance. And let's say performance is good when the error goes down. So this is a, a, a error trajectory. So uh, getting lower, more blue on the surface indicates better performance. So I want to step in a direction um, that is uh, going down. So I might choose to change the parameter settings to favor things that are um, getting better performance or more blue. Okay. So uh, this beam search analogy is something that we can think of even for the idea of scoping our research. So when we think about what type of research we're doing, junior scholars or uh, proposals of research might be looking for questions that are easily facilitated by all of these ancillary products of research, right? Reproducible code, data sets, shared tasks, things that can uh, introduce uh, statistical significance testing so that we can check off all the boxes to make it easier for reviewer number two to accept our research. Okay, and actually what I'm arguing is that exacerbates this loss function. So out of productive areas of research that don't quite have all of those quality markers are going to be harder to research just because of the way that um, those other uh, symptoms or uh, artifacts, if you will, of reproducibility, of statistical significance, of data sets are heightening our, um, our notion that certain types of researches are more favored. Okay, so I'd say that because of these things, the accelerations that we are experiencing in research, which are correlated to the ones that Thomas Friedman said earlier, um, make the gradient steeper, okay? All of this overload of scientific research, we hear it all the time, and you know, over, information overload, more and more research being submitted, uh, it favors the convenient type of research rather than the ones that are more strategic. So a key problem that I see with the way that we're doing research is that, you know, even though we can start our computational experiments anywhere, right? And in fact, uh, you'll see this in a lot of machine learning research, we run experiments several different times, we cross-validate, we use a new set of parameters and we search again. But, you know, scholars like professors or, or PhD students, you know, you choose a topic that takes a lot of time and energy to invest and get skilled in a topic. So we can't do the same thing as our machine learning uh, computers can. We can't start in a new area and say, well, let's search again uh, in a, another place. We are actually sort of confined to that local minimum uh, problem that we see uh, over here, right? That we can only search a small area of the space and we can't say, oh, I'm going to now jump to Russian literature and start uh, researching somewhere over here, for example. Okay. So uh, a tongue in cheek question for all of you. When your algorithmic technique doesn't outperform the state of the art, what do you do? You sigh, say, okay, well, uh, I think I'm gonna get a cup of coffee or all oh, the weekend's coming, uh, iCattle is uh, finishing up. Uh, maybe I could take a break for a while. Or maybe actually the right thing to do would be gather more data. Maybe your technique just needs more data to find the right settings. Or perhaps it's better to try to simplify the model that we have. Maybe it's easier to do a bit more comprehensive search of the settings, uh, you know, widen the beam, so to speak, on our model that we saw on the last slide. Or is it better to read your archive feed? Maybe the right thing to do is say, you know, maybe there was a new uh, paper that came out last week that's worthwhile trying out on my data set, and uh, that's going to give me 
the 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 bang for the buck that's going to get my research published. Or maybe, just maybe, we need to study our problems more carefully. So a while back, there was this question um, on the linguistics uh, stack exchange forum uh, that asked about the differences between natural language processing uh, and computational linguistics. And for most of us, I think most of these are, are these two terms are uh, sort of uh, uh, interchangeable, they're syn uh, synonyms. But I, I think they're not actually that case. Uh, I'd like to say that, um, Really, when we talk about natural language processing, we're talking about the application of techniques uh, to actually deal with uh, language in the wild. Whereas computational linguistics is basically more like computational biology, which is the study of language using computational techniques. The goal is really to learn more about language itself. And it's more a scientific endeavor Whereas natural language processing is more like a engineering endeavor. That means how do I use um, computational power to deal with natural language? So we can boil this down and say, actually computational linguistics is asking more about why. Why does language perform the way that it does? And NLP is more about what. What can we do with the language that we're producing, or can we generate the language in such a way to aid a specific goal? So it's much more um, applications oriented. So why am I talking about all of this? You know, in the context of digital libraries, we really want to think about what is the interchange between what we do in digital libraries, right? We are writing publications where, uh, writing, uh, holding conferences and uh, proceedings and events like this, how could natural language processing help scholars with what we are producing, right? Right now, for the most part, when you go to Google Scholar, when you go to Semantic Scholar, you go to IEEE or uh, JSYST, uh, most of the digital libraries that we have out there are really serving the authors, right? We can see the, um, uh, a H index or G index of a particular offer. You can try to discover uh, which publications they've written. Okay, and uh, we've also worked on ways to uh, provision appropriate access to those articles. But we haven't really done as much as we could uh, to help users of those scientific articles. I think we're starting to see that the community is doing a lot better. Uh, so for example, Semantic Scholar has a lot of tools for this. But I'd like to see more scientists, uh, more digital librarians, trying to work our digital library magic on our own publications. We want to be able to ask the text the right types of questions, to ask why we're doing this research, and not just ask who or what or when. So one of the things I wanted to highlight um, is the idea of what I call an introspective digital library. Okay, so um, Christine Borgman came up with another term earlier than this to differentiate um, uh, a library that has automation. She called it the automated digital library where an OPAC or online public access catalog could be used to search the physical bookshelf. And now we've turned to the digital library, right? Where all uh, or many of the assets we have are totally in digital form. But I think the next step in this evolution will be towards an introspective digital library. So let me explain a little bit about what that means. So the opposite of fast is of course slow. So if we think about a system two version of research, we really wanna take a look at the entire pipeline of what we do as researchers, right? There's the idea that we've all seen with beginning scholars having the enthusiasm of research, then discovering the literature, reading it, um, and then perhaps collecting their own data samples and trying to make sense of what that is, right? Then 
comes the hard work of doing the comparison of different methods and then trying to disseminate that research by publishing it and communicating it in conferences like ICATL. And then, of course, the very important part of maintaining that research, making it available to others, especially if it is um, having a data set or uh, having code that's related to that. Right? We see uh, this uh, sort of hourglass shape here where a lot of it focuses on that nexus point in the middle of comparing and publishing, which is arguably what I think our digital libraries still at this point are really trying to facilitate, you know, the publishing, the uh, sharing, uh, the access of that research, and not so much the other parts, okay, about discovering, about actually aiding people to read the research, make sense of that research, organize it, and maintain it. Those things are also part of this research pipeline, but we don't have a lot of digital library systems that do this very well yet. Okay, and of course, uh, when I teach my students about how to read the scientific literature, we all know that different sections of a paper um, aid this process of research at different times. So when we discover research, we might look at uh, titles and abstracts to decide whether to attend the keynote, for example, or not. But uh, you know, when we get down to comparing uh, different work, we have to re-implement it. So the methods and the evaluation sections come in handy when doing comparison. And so when we go to an introspective digital library, what we want are our systems to support all of those different criteria that I told you about on the last slide, right? The idea that we have uh, opinions um, and uh, being able to tell different parts of the paper as having different goals, right? So this particular system here is an argumentative zoning system. It describes different aims, uh, different backgrounds and contrasts and highlights them in different colors, okay? To aid the discovery part of the mechanism. So, there are lots of other uh, utilities as well. So for example, reading, uh, we have a lot of uh, uh, scholars in the natural language community working on summarization of scholarly documents. So can we use NLP to make the scholarly work easier to access for beginners? Okay, so um, here we have an abstract. Uh, I'll just read it in part, okay. The success or failure of social media is highly dependent on the active participation of its users in order to examine the influential factors that inspire and dynamic and eager participation, this study investigates what motivates social media users to share their personal experiences, information, and support, social support with anonymous others. So this particular study is actually uh, one of our chair's uh, research documents. Okay, and so what I want to illustrate with this is to say that when we summarize scholarly research, we might start with the abstract. This is, in fact, the abstract of, of uh, this team research, um, but it's not the only uh, part that we can use to summarize. What else could we use? Well, one thing we can use is, in fact, looking at this paper, and in fact, this is a paper uh, by our uh, co-chair, uh, Su Yun Sin and her uh, colleague, uh, Sang Yi Oh. Um, and if we look at this particular paper that was published in JSYST, uh, there is a logical document structure that it follows, okay? And as a seasoned scholar, we know that we look at different sections of the document with different um, interests, right? So if we know the logical document structure, it can aid us in, for example, reading the document well. Okay, so when we look at abstracts, actually we can tie them to a uh, idea of what the aim of the abstract sentences are for. So for example, even in the abstract, there's information about the aim of a paper. So it says here, in order to examine the influential factors, this study investigates what motivates social media users to share their personal experiences, right? So that's an aim of this study. We can also see the type of analysis that's being done. So 10 factors, enjoyment, efficacy, uh, learning, personal gain, altruism, empathy, social engagement, community interest, reciprocity, and reputation are tested. 
So this is an analysis sentence. So using this type of sentence categorization can help us get a better picture of what the aim, the analysis, and ultimately when we want to construct a uh, summary to read, uh, we can build one according to the needs of the, the user at the time period when they're accessing an article. So in natural language processing, there is a famous algorithm called PageRank. What it does is it enumerates sentences, okay? Like in a ring, let's say this is sentence four, five, six, and seven, eight, and nine. And it draws an edge between sentences, let's say between sentence 22 and sentence 10, based on um, whether there's a lot of overlap in the words, okay? So uh, once we draw this type of sentence, we can identify nexus points, right? So you can see from this, there's a nexus point at nine, there's maybe a nexus point at 21 and another nexus point at 16, okay? And uh, we can use this information along with this categorization of parts of the document to perhaps describe different sections of the document having different purposes and then categorize each of the nexus as um, key sentences that we'd want to pick. So if I were saying uh, to a beginning scholar uh, who's just starting in the work, uh, why don't we look at aim sentences, look at uh, a large set of literature, look at the aim of all of those works, okay? And then uh, just the orange sentences, for example, and construct summaries of uh, work that's just trying to categorize what is the goal of that research, right? If I'm even less familiar, I might turn to sentences in the background, right? So to get a whole bunch of articles, find the background work so that uh, a junior scholar can then digest that. Or, you know, when they're getting to their own methods to apply research, maybe we could focus on the analysis sections. So scholarly documents also have a little bit more flavor to them. And I'm, I'm speaking uh, to the choir here because uh, you guys all know this, right? We have references and citations and uh, citation sentences actually uh, are the sentences within a citing document. Uh, for example, this document over here that cites uh, O and Sin's work uh, about what they've done, okay? So this uh, citation sentences can often describe a paper from the community's point of view rather than the author's point of view, okay? And uh, has a representation of the key points of a work, right? And citation sentences, and in article sentences from, for example, the abstract or the body of the paper really have complementary purposes, right? If you look at a summary, uh, especially in something like an abstract, you usually don't see uh, that much in terms of uh, uh, particular methods, okay? So uh, for example, results and evaluations, when we cite an article, we rarely cite this information. We cite it for the methods. Um, and sentences that are usually uh, in a paper describe the methods uh, in, in much more detail, and they're not suitable for summary. So many times we will need to go to citation sentences uh, that mention what a study did to find a good summary. And that's true in this paper too. So if you look at this particular paper um, that is from uh, our co-chair Suyun Sin, um, you'll see uh, one of her works, uh, which I'm discussing today, has 127 citations. But really what we want to know is what type of information is being cited? Why is it being cited? I mean, what, what type of functions are, are people saying that this particular work that happened in JSIS, what is this groundbreaking contribution? Okay, so if we look at this particular paper, we can look at and actually read the citation sentences to understand what are the importances, uh, important aspects of this research. So sometimes it can be mentioned uh, in very general terms. So for example, here in the second block um, that I'm showing you, um, there is a case where uh, basically, this is a, a list citation. Basically, there are several different works being discussed, and um, um, Owenson's work in 2015 is one example of that, right? Uh, but there are other cases uh, where we can use citations a bit more uh, dramatically. So, for example, here, um, in this particular sentence, it says, in contrast, users of microblogging sites rate social engagement as the second most important uh, motivation following learning information. 
Okay, so here we see a social aspect. And in this particular last uh, citation context is one that's interesting because it's a contrast. So uh, this is taken from another paper. That paper is trying to differentiate itself from uh, Owen Sin as well as other uh, papers by saying, uh, instead of looking at uh, general social media, they are looking at uh, question and answering uh, sites. So things like Yahoo Answers or Stack Exchange, for example, as a way of differentiating their work from others. Okay, all of this can be a very useful um, analysis that takes into account the location of where uh, references are being made and the syntactic structure in which those sentences have uh, displayed. Okay. So another thing that I want to describe is a serendipitous recommendation. So nowadays we have Google Scholar alerts. We have a lot of different alerting systems trying to give us ideas of what's important to read. And in fact, uh, this work was done uh, by Kaz uh, as part of his work in uh, JCDL 2011, so quite a while back. But the idea is that uh, we would like to have some idea of which people would be more helpful in helping you decide what would be a good piece of information to read, okay? So whom do we want to ask for help if we're doing a collaborative filtering test? Should we ask people on the left, you know, um, people who are dissimilar to ourselves, uh, who are still in the community, perhaps in iCattle, different offers of that, or people from your co-offering network, people who are already quite related to you, which, group of people would be more suitable for helping us understand what is the right way to go about finding other related work. Okay, and it turns out from this work uh, that your co-offer network happens to be a, a better source of information. So you can see it over here uh, on this graph on the right that the, the better performance turned out to be looking for people around you who are not the same as you to pick out other works that uh, might be useful. So, you know, people like you or people, your co-authors have also read these other papers or cited these papers, they might be a good source of information for you as well. So I want to also emphasize that, you know, we are talking about text, but text isn't the only part of scientific uh, uh, sense making and uh, communication, right? We go to keynotes, we go to conferences like AgCattle to both present but also learn from each other. Okay, and uh, just like this presentation, we often show slides, and slides have a, a very useful way of disseminating information, right? Some of the things about slides are, of course, they miss a lot of important technical detail. And uh, for this reason, we actually need both together. We need the slides for visual uh, understanding, but we need the paper for technical detail. So it makes sense to actually pull these two things together in an introspective digital library. Right now, we're still archiving all of this information, but we haven't really tried to integrate it as much as we can. We already have systems nowadays that can uh, coordinate a slideshow, like the one I'm giving, uh, with uh, audio recording. But could we do this with documents themselves? So for example, a published preceding paper in iCattle and its uh, presented slides or the video recording, can we align all of these together so that we can flip between um, different artifacts, right? So on the left-hand side here, we have an artifact, which is the paper. Okay, and we see the align slides as context. And uh, by a press of the keypad, we might be able to flip this around and see the slide, navigate through the slides, but see the align section as context instead. Okay. So when we do this type of alignment, we really want to juxtapose both media together in some type of fine grain manner. And it means that, for example, we need to take a particular set of slides and try to localize them to a section in the document and, uh, and then pull these things together to create a browser that will allow, um, you know, a flipping of context and focus in a fine grain manner. 
And the output of such a technology would be something like an alignment map that allows you to uh, visualize both uh, systems uh, together. And it may not be a monotonic alignment. You know, there might be some skipping or cross alignment between modalities as well. And as I hinted in this section of the talk, it's really a multimodal problem because the types of text slides that we have are pretty large, you know, maybe 50, 6% of the slides in a data set might actually consist of text, but there are actually a very large minority of slides that are not text. So we need multimodal analysis to help out here. We have slides that shouldn't be aligned to anything or outline slides. We have slides that feature mostly plots and images. We have slides that have drawings and some slides that have tables, okay? So without, technology multimedia analysis to do this type of slide analysis it would be very hard to make a, a good multimodal presentation of all of this type of work. And when we look at the error analysis of such a system, it really turns out to be a multimodal problem. We have to um, look more than just at the text because sometimes there's just not sufficient amount of text or enough um, contextual information to align slides very well. Okay, so if you can look at the middle part of this uh, slide here, where we see that images and drawing slides really have very little data in terms of text or very noisy data. So there'll be text boxes, but the text boxes really doesn't have a lot to do with aligning the text um, to the document. Okay, so with all of these technologies and a whole host of other ones that I could spend an entire afternoon talking about, we are trying to instrument the idea of an introspective digital library. The whole point is to start to abet and aid research slow. What we want to do is take the idea of the gradient of a uh, loss in research and you know make it flatter, make it easier to find things around rather than accelerate more and more. What we want is to open up the adjacent possible, meaning that topics that you're already concentrating on, but uh, things um, a bit tangential right now, you can merge the two together, would be a way of facilitating research rather than continue to accelerate it. What we want to be able to do is to benefit from colliding scholars from different areas um, that are adjacent to each other together so that they can benefit from each other and then perhaps engineer new research areas. So what does this mean for me? And this is really the last part of my talk. I know we're running a little bit short on time. Is that, you know, when we think about innovation, we think about Thomas Edison and the light bulb, right? But actually, many people get the wrong impression that the light bulb was created in a single instant, you know, in a eureka moment. But actually, it wasn't that case at all. Thomas Edison wasn't the creator of the light bulb, but he had a whole team of researchers. He has an actual uh, big research infrastructure where he did the marketing, he did the development, he did all of the sales around research in order to popularize uh, the research process. So even though he uh, was credited uh, by many with the invention of the light bulb, he was the one who popularized uh, the entire research framework around this. And so this comes to the idea of research slow too, right? The whole point is that with research slow, we need another framework besides ones that we are dealing with research fast, you know, GitHub, archive, reproducible codes, statistical significance tests. We need other frameworks to help us do research slow better, right? To be able to open up what I've already talked about, which comes from this book, where good ideas come from. I, again, and this is another book that I highly recommend you to read. Um, it's by Stephen Johnson, and he talked about um, these different uh, important techniques to facilitate um, this idea of a scientific uh, idea generation, okay, M much in the same way that you may have heard of the paradigm uh, change uh, from Thomas Kuhn, right, the idea that you have scholars to come together, um, that bump into each other, and uh, are able to propagate uh, ideas through each other, through conversation. And 
This was another work that I came across, uh, again, uh, thanks to uh, Professor Yohei Seki over at Tsukuba for introducing it to me. So this is the concept of Fuben Eki, uh, which stands for further benefit of a kind of inconvenience. I guess that's the English paraphrase. And what was meant by this is that certain operations that we want to do that need to be deliberate, for example, controlling the nuclear reactor, we don't want that to be automated. We don't want it to be easy to control a nuclear reactor because in some ways we need it to be very intentional about what we're doing because those types of systems are dangerous, right? And for example, when we're engineering machine learning systems or digital library systems for deciding the next new research area, we need to put more thought into it rather than just go with the flow of using convenient research as a way of generating new ideas for topics for dissertations or proposals, okay? And uh, by making those key operations deliberate, uh, it helps us to form ownership of those ideas and have an affirmation that in fact, we, we have come up with the ideas on our own, okay? So really what we want to do is uh, synergize what we're doing with research fast Okay, which is what the machine can do for us well, with the human computational abilities of research slow, you know, deliberate um, lateral uh, research where we're thinking serially hard about specific problems. And really, when we come to think about it, acceleration has it really out for us. We see this red curve of technology really taking off. We've seen and heard over the last couple of years or months even that uh, the opportunity gap in technology is so accelerated that uh, things are progressing very fast. But our human adaptability is quite limited in the green curve. And as soon as technology crosses the threshold of human ad adaptability, we have this growing opportunity gap that represents the second half of the chessboard. When things are adapting so fast in technology, but we're not able to keep up with how things are going. And this will change, okay? We see this happening very fast for individuals. So a, a singular person who might be in their secondary or high school is already able to command a lot of deep learning research because of those uh, fast accelerations, okay? And that will be the same for companies, but less so, less so for governments and certainly less so for humanities, okay? So we really need to think hard about not just accelerating research fast, but also thinking about how to tamper our research by thinking through it more carefully. Right now, we see a lot of hype in the way research is communi communicated through public advocates, but what about ourselves? What can we do? So one solution is to ramp up by doing research slow with the time that's gifted by research fast. I'm going to skip this part for because uh, we're running out of time. I'll just say that my group at uh, NUS has uh, come up with some scientific document processing toolkits. These are to facilitate research slower uh, by having uh, systems that you can port out, uh, not relying on Google Scholar, not relying on Semantic Scholar, as these are uh, opaque systems that represent systems that can do research fast but uh, don't allow introspection of their models. So having systems that we can do ourselves is a, a core way of facilitating research slower. So um, in the end, uh, I'd like to say that uh, really what we want to see is more of our own selves, you know, as digital librarians, thinking of our own research, thinking of ways to slow down our research so that we can um, make opinions of it, give stories about it, so that we can catalyze the slow research that needs to happen, rather than just accelerate research through um, all of the code, all of the machine learning that's being done in our adjacent communities. Okay, so I'm reminded about this uh, anime that I saw when I was very young, it's called Castle in the Skies by a very famous uh, anime producing studio, a uh, studio Ghibli, helmed by Hayao uh, Miyazaki, and um, he told uh, of a culture that started as an agrarian culture, became uh, uh, mechanized and uh, became a very advanced technology, but when that technology failed, uh, things crashed, 
and then they were evolved back to that agrarian society. So uh, we're sort of at this stage now where we have a lot of fantastic technology, uh, but if we're not careful in thinking about how to do research slow, we might end up very much where we started, where we don't understand um, the artifacts that we're producing and we have to go back to the basics again. So in conclusion, I I'd like to say, I hope that from this talk, we can agree that research uh, slow and research fast need to combine and, and do things together. We might say that at the beginning, we don't have anything working and we don't know why. Uh, we can fix that by doing research fast, you know, using reproducible code uh, to come up with uh, works that uh, work, but we don't know why. But when we add research slow, we can uh, know why they work. And when we do enough slow research and we can tell the stories behind it, uh, we can help our public understand better. So we should end up with work that works properly. We know why it works and we can advocate for it. And uh, that concludes my talk. So I'm sorry I ran over time. Um, so I'll turn it back over to uh, Dr. Professor Sugiyama uh, to, to do the rest of the session. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Ming, for your interesting talk. Do you have any questions from audience? You can type your questions in chat box. Uh, Asuki, please ask your question. Uh, thank you for a very interesting talk. And uh, I think the, your vision is uh, very great. And uh, I like the, uh, the ideas you are developing now. So my, my question is how to evaluate uh, the effects of the, such uh, techniques and technologies, uh, how do they contribute to, actually contribute to the slow research and the slow hunt, et cetera? How do you evaluate it? I think that's a really difficult question. Uh, along with a lot of things that uh, we do, uh, especially in Singapore where things are very detailed, uh, we want to evaluate fast. We want to be able to give uh, quantitative numbers to everything so that we can rank and we can select. I think uh, one of the things we do need to do is do more storytelling, do more convincing so that we can aid a more subjective evaluation. Okay. I mean, this seems contrary to what we're talking about. I mean, in machine learning, it's all about the numbers. And, and similarly, for a lot of IR research, it's about, uh, you know, the, the statistical significance. Um, in a way, uh, statistical significance and uh, numbers and rankings aid the impression uh, that we're doing good research because we can rank, right? Uh, but uh, the impression of good research, it really depends on the qualitative evaluation measures. So if we really believe that the, the metrics that we're evaluating with are really the right ones to evaluate with, that's fine. But many times I think it, it belies the... The, the fact that we focus on certain things that are easy to measure, right? And not things that are actually uh, qualitatively helpful for society. And, and so um, I think your question is a spot on very good uh, because I don't think there's a really easy answer to that. I don't think there's a really good um, mechanism to evaluate except to say, okay, we really need to think about it. And, uh, you know, there will be errors, but, uh, if we can uh, argue and persuade, maybe that is a good way of mitigating the effects of fast research. I don't know whether that answers your question. <laughs> yeah, I know it's uh, difficult. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> um, any other questions or comments? Okay, so I have one question. Um, publish papers first may be important, but quality is also important. 
Mm, do you have any idea of keeping balance between speed and quality in research work? Yes, I do. Thank you for your question, uh, Professor Sugiyama. I think it requires more dialogue. Um, I think uh, having more conversations between peers, between uh, professors, um, it will help connect the research community more. Right now, I think uh, we lack enough dialogue. So I'm really heartened to see that there's a panel session right after this one, especially to try to address these issues. Because I think the more times we come together, the more as a community we can form what is the right direction of research, right? I think with COVID-19, it has certainly aided certain things, like for example, I can give this keynote here in Singapore while the conference is worldwide, but it certainly made collaboration face-to-face -face much more difficult. And um, we, we really have to work towards a, a, a better understanding of how to do collaborative research when people are not physically able to get together um, uh, I think the verdict is still out on that, but if we can engineer these uh, social systems for supportive research, I think that will be very productive. Okay, uh, thank you very much for your answer. Su Yong, you have a question. Hi, um, thank you so much for a very interesting talk. Um, I, I, I guess this is not a question, but more of a comment. Um, also, following up um, previous questions, um, I think um, I think your um, idea is very provoking and um, provide us um, another way of thinking um, in terms of um, you know the researchers' discussion in terms of how we measure our work um, and you know how we qualitatively measure them as well. Uh, there's more discussion related to this was expanded in terms of um, how the higher education admin looks at it and also how the funders are looks, you know, looking at your work and maybe your, um, you know, your ideas may need to be promoted to them as well. Yeah. I, our I, our ac activities are very much limited, um, bounded based on, on their, um, their goals as well. I think you're very much right uh, that uh, currently we are in in a rich get richer society in, in some ways where um, there's a lot of effort to uh, promote um, good research and differentiate bad research, but I, I think that is a bit un, uncalled for. I think a, a lot of research has its place and good research is one that has an extended dialogue. You know, if you have um, people from a community that's well-intentioned but not well-resourced, they can learn to be good researchers. Uh, it, it requires uh, training. It requires uh, interest. Um, and I think right now the community is uh, really set towards certain agenda that's favored by uh, first world nations um, that already have success in research. So we are ignoring the, what they call the bottom half of the pyramid, you know, the, the, the very large uh, set of population that doesn't have a very good facilities, but has really pressing problems um, that we, we are not solving uh, by looking at issues that uh, are certain, certainly, you know, ivory towerish, right? Um, that, that are uh, important to academics only. Yeah, so um, I, I again encourage uh, our communities uh, to look at research more broadly and um, uh, for us to diversify our research and uh, not just look for goals that are uh, easily defensible because they're conveniently uh, accessible. Okay, uh, thank you very much for your insightful answers. Uh, okay, thank you again, uh, Professor Miyeka, for your talk. Okay, so we have a panel after the keynote session. So I would like to hand over microphone to Amy and Suyo. Uh, not this the, for us, the, maybe Atsuyuki or D. I will share my screen. Yeah. Uh, okay. 
Can you see the my screen? Yes. Okay. So this is a panel uh, for young research.